Dr. Kirsten Gonzalez and Patrick Grzanka from the UT Department of Psychology. Dr. Gonzalez is an assistant professor whose research broadly focuses on the psychological well-being of individuals with marginalized identities, including racial, ethnic minorities, and LGBTQ plus people. Dr. Grzanka is an associate professor of psychology and chair of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Interdisciplinary Program in the college. His interdisciplinary work explores intersecting dimensions of social inequality with a focus on race, gender, and sexualities. Please welcome this evening, Dr. Kirsten Gonzalez and Patrick Grzanka, presenting From White Tears to Social Transformation, Anti-Racism Beyond Guilt. Take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Beatty. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with um, all 143 of you uh, this evening. Uh, no pressure for Dr. Gonzalez and I. We are really uh, uh, looking forward to our conversation. Um, and I am going to share first my video with you and now my screen so you can see some slides. Recently, since the uprisings that began after the murder of George Floyd in May, there has been a surge of interest among white people in books and resources like the ones on your screen that are designed to educate white people about racism and anti-racism. These books are not merely popular. Uh, they represent the best-selling books of the year, topping list after list of critics' choices and sitting at the top of resource guides for white people seeking to develop their understanding of racism and white supremacy, as well as those seeking tools and guidelines for anti-racist work. As people who study whiteness, racism, and anti-racism, we are interested not in critiquing these books or the people reading them, but in thinking about white people's relationships with these kinds of books and this entire genre of what might be called anti-racist self-help. We wanna think about what motivates people to seek out information and resources to cultivate a better understanding of racism and then what white people do with this knowledge. That's a lot of what we do in our academic lives as researchers. We study what, ha what gets people to the point of wanting to buy or read one of these books and then what happens after they consume this knowledge. Though we do different kinds of work, Dr. Gonzalez and I have both investigated the antecedents and consequences of white anti-racism. In particular, I've studied the emotions of anti-racism. And Dr. Gonzalez has examined what allyship looks like for white people trying to live an anti-racist life. Our work is deeply critical to the extent that we are interested in understanding anti-racism within a system of white supremacy. Not congratulating white people for doing the right thing, but for understanding anti-racism as a response to white supremacy that cannot be divorced from white supremacy. And in that sense, any serious consideration or conversation about allyship and anti-racism must never ignore the primacy of white supremacy, white privilege, and racism as the central organizing elements of white people's lives, even white people who identify as anti-racist and who do anti-racist work. It's really imperative that we understand what we mean when we use these contentious terms that are so central to understanding race in the lives of white people. And indeed, much of what we understand about racial inequality, or, or rather how, how racial inequality works and how racism is perpetrated uh, and perpetuated by white people comes from the lived experiences and scholarly inquiry of people of color, especially African-Americans. So in a recent paper, um, Dr. Gonzalez, along with Dr. Lisa Spanierman and I, uh, define white supremacy drawing on critical race theory as a cultural, economic, and political system that sustains white people's dominance over virtually all sectors of society and through which implicit and explicit ideas about white people's superiority are reproduced through everyday dynamics in a wide variety of institutional and social settings. Likewise, we draw on Ruth Wilson Gilmore um, and her influential definition of racism as the state sanctioned or extra legal production or exploit exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. 
And I think that this definition is especially imperative for us to consider as psychologists, because notice that in that definition of racism, we're not just talking about stereotypes, bias, or even behavior, but rather the systemic social forces that subject people of color to premature suffering and death, limiting life chances materially and literally. Finally, whiteness. We define here as cultural practices, culturally and historically contingent practices, socially constructed and linked to, but not determined by phenotype. That is the social construction of race. And we think about whiteness here as a powerful social position. It's really misleading to talk about whiteness as skin color only, or falsely as biological or genetic ancestry, or strictly as an identity. Instead, we use critical race theory to conceptualize whiteness as a social position. We're not uh, talking about this evening how racism and prejudice are something uh, essentially or fundamentally linked to a white racial phenotype or that all white people experience racial privilege in exactly the same way. One of the ways that conversations about racism get derailed, in fact, is by individual white people defensively posturing that they do not benefit from a particular instance of white privilege or by claiming exceptions to patterns of white supremacy. The experience of class oppression or sexual minority status, for example, is never an excuse to avoid or deflect considerations of racial privilege. And intersectionality, in other words, should never be used as a backdoor out of accountability for white supremacy. That is not productive or helpful. Now, these aren't just abstract academic ideas. They're felt experiences. And when we reduce racism, as psychologists often do, um, to strictly psychological, cognitive, or behavioral processes, we miss what we call the affective dimensions of white racism and anti-racism, or the subject of our conversation this evening, white racial emotions. These are just some of the important ones that we'll be addressing today. Now, as academic psychologists, we do not want to set up a false dichotomy between intellectual work or scholarship and our actual lived experiences and feelings about race. So we want to try to get in our feelings a little bit. You should have expected that coming from the two of us. Uh, we need to talk about and be in our feelings for this conversation because they're important. So we have two different prompts, depending on how you identify. Uh, for the white people on this call, we want you to take a moment to think about a recent encounter you've had with a person of color where you felt badly afterwards because of something you said or did that might have been racist. We want you to ask yourself, how did you feel? What are some feeling words that you would associate with this encounter? And for the people of color on the call, think about a recent encounter you've had with a white person or group of white people in which the white person asked you to make them feel better. How did you feel during this request? What are the words you would use to name your feelings? What words would you use to name the white person's feelings or, pe or white people's feelings? And we're gonna give just a few moments for everyone to sit and think about this. This can be a deeply uncomfortable process. And we use that word purposefully, process. It's part of a journey. We want to encourage you, especially the white people on this call to get there into these feelings and to try and stay there for the next 45 minutes. Uh, we don't want you to run away uh, from those feelings. We want to spend just this brief time together thinking about those feelings, what they do for us, the work they do in the world sociologically, and how we can harness these feelings in the interest of social transformation, not just in the interest of feeling better. 
Now, interestingly enough, white people have a lot of feelings about white guilt. I was first drawn to this concept many years ago in the beginning of graduate school uh, because it seemed like it was used really as a kind of catch-all or umbrella term to describe a wide range of emotions, behaviors, and attitudes. It seemed like both everything and nothing that white people did. Um, it was a really imprecise term, and it often seemed weaponized. Something in particular that I saw white people accusing other white people of for a range of reasons. And I also saw it used by liberals and conservatives alike to accuse other white people. Whoever was invoking it almost always seemed to be suggesting that whoever was doing the white guilt was worse than the speaker was when it comes to race. Uh, on the, on the um, I think it should be the right side of your screen, although we're mirroring, I, I have a list of some of the things that I think white people say to each other about, about white guilt. Now, on the contrary, in conversations with and in research by people of color, I certainly heard uh, black people in particular talk about not wanting to have to manage white people's emotions about racism. But I also didn't hear black and other people of color saying that they wished white people felt less bad about racism. So there seemed to be some contradictions at play and certainly a whole lot of confusion and ambiguity about this concept. As a social scientist, it seemed to me that we need to take this emotion as seriously as we would any other one so that we can operationalize it and measure it carefully to understand what it does. So I turned to the really robust literature on the psychology of what we call negative self-conscious or self-focused emotions and to this classical distinction between guilt and shame. Now, guilt is routinely defined by psychologists as negative feelings about one's behavior. An example would be, I feel so bad about skipping her birthday party. I feel so bad about lying to my partner. I should probably apologize for what I said. We understand these emotions to be somewhat pro-social, like to the extent that feeling bad about doing bad things is a really important part of living a moral life. If you don't ever feel bad about doing bad things, you can't recognize those things as bad and adjust your behavior accordingly. Now, shame on the other hand is kind of classically operationalized as painful and intense negative feelings about the self. So shame is more severe and more global. An example is I'm a terrible person. I can't face myself. How could anyone love me? Shame, uh, unlike guilt, tends to be unproductive and even antisocial. It focuses people's attention inward uh, towards a, a incapacitating evaluation of who they are and the groups that they belong to. And it's associated with things like spare and depression, also anger. Though much of the existing research on white guilt uh, by psychologists and sociologists had conflated guilt and shame, I found, I tried to translate the insights of the psychology of emotion into uh, the existing research, uh, the anti-racist scholarship on white feelings. So I also had to consider the literature on collective guilt and shame because it's been well established that we can feel bad about being part of a group, even if we personally don't feel responsible for a particular transgression. Colloquially, we uh, know this as guilt by association. So I worked through the following distinctions. We define white guilt as negative feelings about one's own behavior as a white person or association with other white people. Examples of this that I've gathered from my research and, and from others is, I feel really bad that I misremembered my black colleague's name, an example of feeling bad about a microaggression. I'm so embarrassed by my fraternity's racist jokes. This is guilt by association and group membership. And here is an example of feeling motivated to behave differently through guilt. I need to make up for my past racist actions now that I recognize what I've done. 
White shame, on the other hand, represents painful, intensely negative feelings about being white, not just doing things that might be racist, but group membership. Uh, ex an example would be, I hate being white. I wish I weren't white. White people are hopeless. We are irredeemable. Psychologists who study generic guilt and shame, however, have always seemed to emphasize that the emotional rejection of these feelings was just as essential to the feelings themselves. So that like any conversation about guilt and shame has to involve all the things people do to not feel guilty and to not feel shameful. Um, the avoidance of guilt and shame is so central to this process that leaving that out would be to miss a central way that people ever experience negative emotions about themselves or their social groups. The two central themes um, in, in this literature are the externalization of blame, blaming other people for a problem, or detachment, removing oneself from culpability by expressing that the problem isn't a problem at all, or if it is, I don't have anything to do with it. We found that these logics were deeply intertwined with one another. They were really difficult to parse out actually in white people's emotional lives when it comes to race and racism. So in my work, we called this negation. Now note that this is not strictly a feeling, uh, but just like guilt and shame, it involves the perception of a racial situation, in this case, uh, the perception that something is not racist, and uh, an associated cognitive and affective process. So uh, examples here that we found were, it's not my fault that your feelings are hurt. Uh, why do black people always have to make it about race? Uh, or this externalization of blame, if something did happen, uh, she probably deserved it. Now, once we had operationalized definitions of these terms and we had developed effective measurement tools uh, for assessing people's propensity uh, for white guilt, white shame and negation, specifically when it comes to anti-Black racism, we started to measure these feelings and their relationships with anti-Black racism, prejudice and discrimination. And I'm gonna summarize briefly some of our key findings, which helped to ground our conversation in what white people can actually do, uh, uh, which is what Kirsten is gonna talk about. So what we found um, in a really reductionist way that I'll summarize is that one of these things is definitely bad. One of them seems a bit worthless and potentially bad. And the other seems like it's potentially a good thing, at least as a first step. So when we looked at the correlation between white guilt and anti-black racism, we've consistently found, as have other scholars, this moderate to strong negative relationship. That is the more white guilt one has, the less expression they have of anti-black racism. This is sort of generically something that we'd hope to see. White shame on the other hand, exhibits this weak negative relationship. So not as strong of a predictor of anti-black anti racism. Um, so that means that while there might be some correspondence between levels of, black, uh, of white shame and lower levels of anti-Black racism, this relationship is much weaker than the strong relationship that we see between, strong negative relationship we see between white guilt and anti-Black racism. Finally, negation. Strong, positive relationship between these two. The more detaching, the more externalization of blame that people are feeling with regard, that white people are feeling with regard to racism, the more we can predict that they're going to exhibit higher levels of anti-Black racism. This is all really important to know because it helps ground our understanding of white people, what white people do with their racial emotions. But it doesn't lead us to answers to the question of what happens after one feels these things. What happens after white guilt? Psychologists have observed experimentally that white guilt seems to predict compensatory behaviors, but not transformative ones. So for example, support for uh, 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 affirmative action quotas, but not structural and institutional transformation in the interest of anti-racism. The broader literature on self-conscious emotions suggests that white guilt may only motivate behavior so long as the person actually feels guilty. So once a guilt alleviation strategy works, like let's say, for example, attending a protest, if the guilt goes away, the anti-racist behavior may go away. 
So white guilt may only be as powerful as the feelings of guilt itself. And as I turn things over to Kirsten, I leave us with this kind of paradox of guilt. We need it to some extent. As a moral emotion, it plays a critical role in catalyzing people to see racial inequality, to recognize their role in it, and to do something about it. But we need more than guilt. Not shame, but a sustained commitment to anti-racism that exceeds the limits of guilt without the narcissism and self-loathing of shame. All right, um, so I'm going to begin by talking about allies. And so I think it is always helpful to have a definition of allies so we can contextualize this talk and what we're talking about. So allies are people uh, who are members of the dominant or majority group who work to end oppression in their personal and professional lives through support of and as advocates with and for an oppressed population. So there are three main takeaways that I really want you to consider as you consider thinking about your identity as an ally or maybe somebody who is growing in their ally identity. So the three main takeaways of this definition are one, that allies are typically people who are privileged in some way, shape or form. So have some sort of privileged status or identity. Allies tend to work to end oppression at all levels of our socio-ecological system, which means that allies challenge their own oppressive thoughts and feelings and behaviors, but also challenge the oppressive thoughts and feeling behavior and behaviors of other people and challenge oppressive institutions and organizations and finally challenge oppressive legislations and policies that are uh, reinforce structural oppression. The third point that I want to make is that allies work alongside members of oppressed groups to advocate on behalf of and with oppressed people. So the key here is that allies don't kind of go off on their own and make decisions about what's necessary and needed for the marginalized group that they're working with, but they work in coalition and collaboration with marginalized community members. Understanding the experiences of allies is really important because allies help us to understand the shift or the transformation from just holding positive feelings and attitudes toward a marginalized community member or group to actual behavioral intentions and actions and advocacy efforts. So specific to our talk today, I'm talking about anti-racist. So Patrick, you can go to the next slide. So anti-racists are persons who have committed themselves in thought and action and practice to dismantling racism. Racism and white supremacy and their elimination are the daily focus of an anti-racist identity. So there's been a lot of research done on anti-racists, how folks develop into an anti-racist identity, um, what, how other people categorize or characterize anti-racists. And what I'll say is that most of the important scholarship on white allies, so when we're talking about anti-racists, we're often talking about white people. And we who have Brady on the leash. Actually, we're talking to Grandma. Brady came jumping in. Why did it come jumping in? I think we have, okay, there we go. <laughs> so when we're talking about the scholarship on white allies who engage in anti-racist work, we're often looking at scholarship that asks people of color to talk about their experiences with white people who have been anti-racist allies or who've been important uh, in the efforts to engage in anti-racist work. So people of color often identify white allies as those who demonstrate caring and respect for people of color, but also who demonstrate that they actively want to fight toward Racial, for racial justice. Uh, people of color who are asked to distinguish between white friends versus white allies often identify two key characteristics that distinguish people from being friends versus allies. And those are that their allies are intentionally affirming and they commit to anti-racist action. And so the action piece is a theme that you'll hear consistently throughout the next set of my slides because action is really what distinguishes us from just having positive feelings or even maybe struggling with those um, ambivalent feelings. So the often missing link between white people who hold a non-racist identity and white people who are anti-racist are actions and fighting white supremacy. We have some good, uh, good analogies or good mechanisms for explaining or differentiating between racist and anti-racist. And we often use a conveyor belt analogy. I'm gonna ask you to think about a moving walkway in an airport. I think we've all probably been in an airport or been on a moving walkway before, and we kind of can envision it in our minds, right? 
So active racists are folks who uh, walk forward quickly on the moving walkway in the direction of the moving walkway. And those are folks who actually believe in and perpetuate white supremacy. Those are kind of the, the folks who are actually doing the most harm and engaging in um, the most problematic behaviors and actions and causing uh, difficulty and distress for people of color. Unintentional racists are folks who, if we think about the moving walkway, they're walking slowly down the moving walkway, still moving in that same direction. Non-racists are folks who are standing still on the moving walkway, so they're not moving, but they are moving because they're on the moving walkway, so they're headed in that same direction. And all three, active racists, unintentional racists, and non-racists, um, perpetuate white supremacy and do the most harm because they're not engaging in activist and advocacy work to challenge white supremacy and challenge their own whiteness. Anti-racists, on the other hand, are folks who are walking on the, in the opposite direction on the moving walkway. So if you can envision a moving walkway, and I'm sure you've been in an airport where you had a child kind of running in the opposite direction on the moving walkway, and it's actually really challenging to get off the moving walkway when you're supposed to be headed in the other direction. But those really characterize anti-racist because those are folks who are engaging in the activist work, who are challenging all of these kind of levels, the individual level, interpersonal level, institutional level, and policy level. White anti-racist allies commit to anti-racist action that challenges the racism and disrupts white supremacist systems. Unfortunately, the vast majority of white people do not identify as anti-racist. In fact, I'll ask, I'll ask or I'll encourage all of you to think about how do you characterize or identify yourself if you're a white person? What does that work look like? Um, and even if you're a white person who stands in solidarity with people of color, often white people do not use the anti-racist anti label to uh, identify themselves. I think that there are a variety of reasons why that could be, but the predominant one that I have encountered in my own work and my own research is that white people don't know how to have conversations about their whiteness. They don't know how to um, talk about having a, a white racial identity. They don't know how to talk about the ways in which they reinforce and perpetuate white supremacy in their daily lives and how they do harm to others. And I think that deep interrogation of whiteness is really what is the critical component for making the shift into an anti-racist ally. So in our paper and uh, our colleague, our colleague who wrote our paper with us, we, we know that there are some pitfalls to avoid in the journey to an anti-racist ally identity, which I think are important to talk about today. So one of them is paternalism. And we often see this when we see kind of white savior dynamics unfold. And so white people feel the need to save people of color or to speak on behalf of people of color. And this can often or sometimes be perpetuated by a, a desire to get rid of the guilty feelings that they have. And this is problematic because it reinforces white supremacist ways of thinking because you have white people who are assuming that they know best and that they should be listened to over building kind of coalitions and actual communities with folks of color and white people working together. Superficiality is the second pitfall to avoid. And I think over the past several months, we've had lots of dialogues and debates about this, that we tend to see in a response to a racist event or a white supremacist event happening, we see lots of statements happen. So people, organizations, individuals um, make statements and posts about standing in solidarity with people of color. And that in and of itself isn't bad. So it's not a good or a bad thing. But what happens or what the pitfall that happens is often that statement, that rhetoric is not accompanied by action, is not accompanied by any sort of commitment to engage in different behaviors, to challenge behaviors, to challenge the behaviors of others. And so that's where kind of it falls flat. The third pitfall is over identification. So this idea that uh, kind of this post-racial society that you know we are all kind of working together. And an example of this is a white woman telling a black woman, I know exactly how you feel because we both experience sexism. And that really neglects and ignores the lived reality of the ways in which white, supr white supremacy um, oppresses people and people of color specifically. Finally, hijacking is the last pitfall that we really encourage people to avoid. And that's really recentering whiteness in ways that don't actually meaningfully have white people interrogating their whiteness. So I think recentering whiteness in ways that promote fragility and promote an inability to kind of engage in meaningful work. Fortunately, our work has 
suggested that there are some important components to how we can avoid those pitfalls and develop a white anti-racist ally identity. At the foundation, knowledge is important. Awareness of race, individual and interpersonal prejudice, structural racism, white supremacy, knowledge and information about all of those constructs and, um, and how those affect the, the lived experiences of people and people of color is really important to an anti-racist stance. So that knowledge and awareness piece is so important. So as Patrick mentioned earlier in the slides, those books that y'all are hopefully reading, that all is really good. So keep reading those books. Um, but those knowledge and awareness alone is not enough. And the work that Patrick has done and the work that I have done, some of my earlier work, suggests that in order to really develop into an ally, into an anti-racist ally, there has to be some sort of feeling component, some sort of experiential feeling experience that's going to help people to shift their behaviors and keep shifting their behaviors. So keep re-engaging and keep working and act acting and um, advocating for systemic change. So empathy and guilt are really powerful emotions and they should be productive emotions. So instead of trying to get rid of them or stay away from them or push away from them, we should use them as our mechanism for changing our behaviors. And my own research, my earlier research suggests that these feelings are integral to that behavioral change component. Finally, a white anti-racist ally identity, it's important to develop a meaningful, exp or it's important to have a meaningful exploration of whiteness. And so that means, what is it, what is your racial identity as a white person? How does whiteness operate in our society and in our global world? What does white privilege look like? How does um, your identity as a white person perpetuate or reinforce white supremacist systems and systemic oppression. A deep interrogation of that means that we're not running away from those questions and we are constantly trying to think about how that informs our behavior. So using our feelings to inform our behavior instead of trying to move away from them. Over the last uh, several months, I've really appreciated some of the, the the graphics and the things that I've seen on social media. And one of the important graphics that I've noticed is this discussion and distinction between performative allyship and authentic allyship. And so performative allyship, really folks who are engaging in that type of allyship are doing so to feel good about ourselves, to get rid of the guilt and the, the feelings, the negative feelings that we're having, to get uh, brownie points or a pat on the back, to um, actually get acknowledgement and recognition for the work that, um, that those folks are doing. So if you look at this graphic, you'll see that folks often center themselves and they're concerned with optics and they're not really focused on the behaviors they're engaging in. However, we have other information that really suggests that authentic allyship is much better. And, and uh, if you look at that graphic, you'll notice that there's several pieces of information that I've already talked about in terms of the commitment to anti-racist work. So the behavioral commitments, the sitting with the discomfort and having your feelings and using those productively, um, not making it about yourself. So authentic allies are often not concerned with getting appreciation or acknowledgement. And I think the most, uh, the most effective authentic allies are ones who work behind the scenes, who take no credit and, and need no acknowledgement for the work that they're doing. So they're committed to anti-racist work and it's not about you. In our paper, um, my paper with Patrick and uh, Lisa Spanierman that, that Patrick mentioned a, a bit earlier, we provide several tools that we think can be used to combat white supremacy. So on the right side of your screen, you'll see a list of the tools that particularly remain or um, particularly pertain to allies. And so first is tr transforming predominantly white organizations to be self-critical about their whiteness. And one of the ways in which you might do that is through accountability groups for white people. And so we first have to have the difficult and the uncomfortable conversations and the feelings about what it means to be white in this society, in this country, and I think in the, in the world too. And we often don't do that. And it's very threatening and very um, scary to have those conversations. And so um, that's the first step. Ally research that centers the perspectives of people of color when we explore how white allies can combat white supremacy and work toward the liberation of people of color. I talk a little bit about the ongoing work that I'm doing currently and that pertains to this uh, line. We need to focus on truth and reconciliation and privilege disinvestment for predominantly white institutions and communities. And we need to look at the you know, transnational literature and the research that can support this disinvestment. 
creating and supporting spaces within predominantly white institutions for white people to learn about whiteness, develop white anti-racist identities, heal from their own racism and the pain that they've caused others, and engage in institutional transformation. So I think, you know, talks like these, these types of series are ways in which white people can continue to explore and think about what it means to be a white person and how that can in inform or impact their anti-racist work. And finally, foregrounding the interests and needs of people of color, identifying points of resistance among white people in the design and evaluation of community-based interventions, and consulting with communities of color to learn how psychological science can promote attitude and behavioral transformation among white people. So really the idea of building coalitions between white allies and people of color so that we can better understand how we can engage in this transformative process. Okay, so one of the things that Patrick and I talked a lot about when we were planning for this talk was you probably signed up for this thinking that you were gonna get a checklist of ways for you to be a better white person. You probably thought, oh, I'll get some tips and tricks on how to be a good white person. And ultimately, I hope that what you're hearing from us is it's not as easy as that. And it often involves a lot of work to think about yourself and think about your feelings and how that can inform your behaviors. But we do want to give you some things to think about and some concrete things to think about as you consider how you might start your own transformation. So I mentioned that I have some ongoing work where I weave myself and students in my lab and a colleague of mine. Um, we asked uh, queer and trans folks of color, people of color broadly as well, to talk about what's helpful and what's unhelpful about the allies in your life. So the self-identified people who have been allies to you. And you'll, if you glance at this list on the right part of your screen, none of these should be surprising to you. None of them I think are super new and um, unknown. But I think speaking out on behalf of people of color, protesting and speaking out in friend groups, the constant uh, challenging, the behavioral challenges of confronting racism when you see it, listening to people of color, so relying on people of color in, in terms of asking or, or understanding what the needs are of the community and not assuming that you know best as a white person. Checking in on and interacting with people of color is really important for our participants in terms of talking about like, please build an authentic relationship with me. Don't just swoop in like a white savior and act like you know what's best for me if we don't have a, an, a meaningful authentic relationship. So that means building community as white people with folks of color and building those coalitions. Asking questions to understand the experiences of people of color. Now, this doesn't mean that you should ask people of color to educate you about their re reality and lived experiences, but it does mean that you should ask, what can I do for you? How can I support you? How can I be helpful? Those are the questions that you need to be asking if you're wanting to ask people of color about their experiences. Holding positive feelings toward people of color is important, as, as was indicated in previous slides. So being open-minded and respectful and kind and accepting. Um, acknowledging and recognizing privilege as a white person and behavioral support. That behavioral support is really important, as we mentioned before. And then educating yourself. So that knowledge and awareness piece uh, shows up again. Finally, I really like this graphic, how to be a racial transformer. And you, if you wanna look at it or use it, you can see the colorlines.com, that's where it came from. But I like it because it provides like a really holistic view of how we might uh, think about anti-racist work and what that might look like. And that means that we're listening and we're watching and we're using our bodies and we're using the ways in which we can kind of move and think about how we can dig in to do this work. Um, and so, I guess I want to end by saying that, of course, we want white people to challenge your own racist thoughts and behaviors that reinforce white supremacy. But we also want you to start thinking about the ways in which you challenge others, you challenge institutions, and you challenge policies that reinforce structural oppression and racism specifically. If you're doing the readings, so at the individual level, if you're reading all those books at the start of our presentation, that's great. We want you to keep reading, keep reading all of the books. That's wonderful. And if you've made decisions to not shop at Amazon, instead shop at black owned businesses, that's great too. We encourage you to do all of those things. And now I'm gonna ask you some hard questions. And these might be a little bit more comfortable, uncomfortable for you to think about. But I would encourage you to start thinking about where you choose to live, how you choose to raise your children if you have children, the church that you go to or other social institution that you belong to, the things that you watch and your family watches on TV. Um, 
think about those things. How do you use your time? And where does your, what does your ongoing racial justice work look like? Where do your financial resources go? And how are you using your power and access and your positionality to advance racial justice initiatives and social transformation in your own life, in your work setting, in your personal life, in your community? And finally, how are you advocating at state and national levels and challenging racist and white supremacist ideologies and policies? These are harder questions that we want you to think about and they're not designed to have easy answers. So I can't give you a checklist of things to do that are all of a sudden gonna answer these questions for you. And I'll end with, if you're having any emotional feelings or reactions to the questions I just asked you in response, I want you to hold on to be those feelings and be curious about them and lean into them and don't let them overwhelm you because those feelings and the continued feeling of those feelings is what's going to move you into your own anti-racist work and maybe shift the narrative for yourself. So I will um, pass it over back to Patrick and then I guess we'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Kirsten and, and Dr. Beatty. I think we, uh, we're good to we're good to talk now. Great, fantastic. Mm -hmm.